everybody, I'm Bill Sanders, and this is Watch Art Sci, the Art and Science of Watch Collection. Uh, today, what we're going to be talking about is constant force. And in order to help explain uh, constant force, I'm going to use an example of this little uh, wind-up toy car. As you wind it up, and then you release, uh, in this case, the brake. Now, what happens is that it starts off very fast because the tension in the spring is stronger. And then as the, the uh, spring extends itself to its uh, full unwound state, it slows down. Now, the same thing is true with a watch, is that when you first wind it up, it has a lot of power. And then as it becomes unwound, the power drains off. Now, here's the problem with that. If you've got a watch that's fast at first and slows down at the end, it's going to throw off the time. And this has been a watchmaker's problem forever, <laughs> at least making mechanical watches. So uh, we're going to start with uh, taking a look at one solution. And that solution is called the... Raymond Trois de Egalité. Okay, Egalité is the from the French revolutionary uh, term uh, liberty, equality, and and fraternity. The Egalité is the equality, and so here they're using uh, the Raymond Trois Egalité is equaling. How do we equal the power in a watch so it's the constantly at the same speed. Okay, well, this first one that we're going to look at is the, and we're going to use it for the watch of the week, sort of killing two birds with one stone here, is by Andreas Steller, and it's called the Sauterel. Sauterel uh, has a Remontois de Egalité in it, and that's the major feature of this watch. They're extremely expensive, unfortunately. Now, why? I don't know, <laughs> but they are. Uh, this one's $92,000, and the platinum version is $108,000. That's, that's, I know it's just people are thinking, well, I'm not, <laughs> not going to have one of those anytime soon. But the interesting thing about it is the innovative way that they went about to get the watch to have a constant time using the Remontois Egalité. So let's take a look at, uh, at what they did here. And the, the solution is, is one that is, is not a simple solution, I'll put it that way. There are a lot of different ways that uh, in the past that the uh, watchmakers have have created uh, Raymond Watt Egalité. Uh, F.P. Jorn had one that he did, and it, it was a work in concert with a Tubiron. Uh, Tubion. All right, but here's how Andrea Stella did. I'm going to read this little uh, blurb to you. He he placed it on the second wheel. Now the second wheel or the seconds wheel, is the wheel that turns the seconds, and he used the jumping seconds. And the, the escapement wheel supplied the same amount of energy to the second hand as to the Raymond Trois Egalité. And so what happened was that when this wheel turned, it wound up a, a little hairspring. And then the hairspring would kick the seconds over, and, the, and then it would go back and wind it up again. So you have this little um, uh, thing that you can see there. One was, was clicking it, and then one was undoing it. And so it was sort of like this. And the... The energy of the 
jumping seconds was indicated as the uh, second hand moved. And the energy that was accumulated in the course of every second by a star shape, you can see that star shape near the uh, top of the mechanism, is that what it did, it tensioned the hairspring. And then the mechanism is released, the balance uh, receives the energy stored in the hairspring, and the satellite wheel again rests against the stopping jewel. <laughs> I don't understand all of that, but I do understand this concept. And the concept is, is that you have a, another spring, the main spring turns the mechanism, and this one little thing that kicks a second over winds and then unwinds and winds and unwinds. And so by this winding and unwinding, you have a constant force. Okay, so I thought that was, uh, that was a very, uh, very innovative and a very interesting a way to go about doing it. The um, you can see the uh, Riemann uh, toi de Galate on top of the movement uh, in this picture. All right. Um, well, that was uh, that was something. <laughs> and now what I want to take a look at is well, you know how do how do other watches handle this problem? And, and there are different solutions. The uh, would probably the simplest solution is to have a, a certain amount of the spring that is wound and unwound and sort of have it between the, the uh, parameters. Um, Ryan Schmidt in his book on, uh, on, uh, on watches uh, talks about using the first 20% and, and up to the last 20%. So you sort of go between 80 and 20% and your, your power level is more constant. This other solution that I like, it's on my um, Chronometer uh, Souverain uh, by F.P. Jorn. It, it's got these two barrels. And when I first saw the barrels, I thought, oh, well, the barrels are used for um, having a giant spring in it so that it would last longer. And in some respects, I suppose that's what it does. Each of the, there's two springs, one in each barrel about a meter long. And, but what it does is that it keeps them loosely wound. And so in, instead of winding both barrels up uh, tightly, they're, they, they're wound to a certain point where the, where the um, wind is relatively loose. And because you have two barrels, you have a, a longer time span uh, for them to, uh, to totally unwind. And that was their solution. Now, part of the, um, the watch also has what's called a power reserve indicator. And you can see it uh, there is between uh, 14 and uh, 28. And uh, this one, the interesting thing about FP Jorn, it goes from zero to 56. So when it's fully wound, that means the zero has been, there's zero time since it was last wound. And that's the opposite of most uh, indicators that have what I call a gas tank <laughs> uh, meter on it. Uh, but this one, the uh, F.P. Jorn has a good reason for it. It's sort of interesting. Uh, this, in the old days, uh, the chronometers on a ship, if that thing wasn't correct and wound on a regular basis and it stopped, these guys would be lost at sea because it was, it was used to know when to make a reading so you knew where you were. Extremely important. And so what uh, F.P. Jorn did, he simply used the same one. You can see on the uh, top there, uh, the F.P. Jorn is at zero, and uh, that means it's fully wound. And then below, you can see on the power reserve indicator that they have on the uh, ship's chronometer, uh, this goes 0, 8, 16, this is wind, and then 32, 40, and so forth. Winding was a matter of life and death, uh, back then. It was, uh, it was extremely important. Now, um, 
the other watches uh, that have this, there's a wonderful one on Kaz's um, Cartier Pasha at the bottom. You can see how the uh, the power reserve indicator, now this is on what I call the gas tank model. It, uh, when it's wound to 45, that means it's all totally wound up and then it goes to zero. Uh, I think intuitively today, most people see that as opposed to the um, ship's chronometer, but the ship's chronometer uh, concept is sort of fun too. Uh, you know, another thing too, this is something I wanna talk about. The, the watches we look at today are just, uh, are, are pretty expensive watches. I mean, uh, the, the, uh, the Cartier Pasha, the uh, uh, chronometer Souverain, and of course <laughs> the uh, uh, one by Andreas, any one by Andreas Streller is just these really expensive prices. But you can find these on less expensive watches. I found one, for example, I found a really neat one. I found a neat watch too. I think it's neat. Uh, it's an Orient watch. These are these are not expensive watches. This is a a, a wound up a wind up watch. And it has the uh, power reserve indicator right at the top, right, be uh, right below the 12. And it's got Breguet uh, hands. It, uh, on, it's sort of cool little, I think it's a neat looking watch. I like it. And you know, those things uh, are not expensive. Uh, so th this, that's the first thing I'm pointing out. Now, the next thing um, is we're gonna have an unboxing. And what we're gonna unbox is another very inexpensive innovation. So let's take a look at the, uh, <laughs> we're gonna have, open the box. Okay, we'll just open up this little guy right here. And take a look and see what we got. Okay, well, <laughs> the wrapping isn't, very elaborate on this one. Uh, so we'll uh, get the, this thing together. And so let's take a look what we got here with our uh, Seiko. Um, the, it's a military style watch. And the important thing about this is the fact that we have a watch that, uh, while it does have a, well, it is a quartz watch, it has a, the back of it here, you can see it, it has a rotor, okay? So what happens is it works something like this. Let's, I hope you can see this okay. Um, the way it works is that this rotor um, generates the electricity that is stored in these uh, these special uh, compartments, and the those are the things that charge the quartz. And so, even though it is a, a quartz watch, uh, it has a rotor to generate uh, the electricity. So it's a uh, it's, it's, it's an interesting kind of thing. And one of the things, and the point I wanted to make with this particular watch, uh, you can find some really interesting innovations in watches that aren't terribly expensive. And uh, this is one example of where you have a, um, you might call it a quartz automatic, I think is what they call it, where you have the rotor uh, generating the, um, the juice. <laughs> Uh, to run the uh, quartz from. Okay. So as you can see, um, you can have innovation with a very affordable watch. And uh, this Seiko with the, uh, there's the kinetic uh, system that they have, uh, it, it's basically a, an auto quartz. Now I know quartz is a we don't talk about quartz watches, uh, but this one is sort of okay because it's also got a rotor in the back that uh, can wind it up. Uh, other innovations that you have in, in both accuracy and constancy 
and a watch is one that is sort of the watchmaker's, oh, I guess, test of excellence. And it's called a tourbillon. And a tourbillon was first proposed in, actually by uh, Breguet, who, who invented so many things. And um, these things are like super expensive. And, you know, I, I think there's one. Tag Hoyer has one for uh, $15,000. And uh, he was criticized, not he, but the, the company, Tag Hoyer, was criticized by somebody at uh, Paddock Philippe for having one that inexpensive because these things are, you know, they're a forty fifty thousand dollar um, watch. Well, I found one on a Seagull for only $1,200. So again, there are a lot of really interesting uh, things that, that you can find if you look around for it. And again, we're going to go back to the whole issue of constant force in a mechanical watch. In other words, getting a constant force from the spring because the whole power system in our watches is this little spring. And it doesn't matter whether it's a, a FP Journe or a, a very affordable Seiko. They both run on springs. And the extent to which they can have a constant force, they give us accurate time. Well, uh, of course, this guy has a quartz in it, and that's, <laughs> that's no fair. All right, uh, listen, uh, I'd like to hear your comments, what you think about this. And, you know, something else, too. Um, I looked around to see if there was an affordable um, Raymond Toit de Egalité. I couldn't find one. Uh, the F.P. Jorn and the Andrea Stella, both of those are very expensive. So if you know of one, leave a comment. Okay, I'd love to hear from you about that. Also, too, I'd like to hear, hear from you what you think about some of these innovations. And remember, uh, you can find innovations just about anywhere. And I'd like to know about, you know, what's your favorite innovation for making mechanical watches uh, more, oh, I don't know what, uh, accurate. And see if we can find one that we can all afford. Okay, this has been uh, Bill Standard with Watch Art Site. Hey, and I'll see you Sunday. And by the way, this is an, inven an, an invention, an invitation to subscribe. See you Sunday.